So finally, we get to angiosperms, our most important partners on the earth, plant-wise. We'll talk first about a couple of important characteristics of flowering plants that distinguish them from gymnosperms as well as the rest of the plant kingdom. And then we'll do a quick and dirty survey of the major taxa of flowering plants. Now, flowering plants have flowers, of course. But what are flowers really? Taking the Evo Devo approach here requires us to back up and think about the flower's origin as a specialized variation of a normal twig or branch on plant's shoot. The parts of the flower, like petals and stamens, are really modified versions of that branch's leaves. Yes, a flower really is just a branch. In this simplified picture, a growing plant can initiate either a normal vegetative branch or a flower by flipping a switch. The regulatory gene leafy is either activated, causing the branch primordium to switch to flower formation, or it remains off, causing the branch to develop normally with normal leaves but no reproductive parts. Once under the pattern of development triggered by leafy, the leaves on this branch begin to develop into the familiar parts of flowers. Sepals and petals that serve to attract the pollinators and sometimes reward them with nectar. Other leaves develop into microsporophylls, leaves with microspores. Still others develop into megasporophylls, leaves with megaspores. A prototypical perfect flower, and here perfect means complete, has both male parts, microsporophylls, as well as female parts, megasporophylls. The stamens of a flower are its microsporophylls. I know the stamens on your typical flower don't look like leaves and not being flat. Usually they consist of a long, thin filament with an anther at its tip. But if you look at the stamens of basal flowering plant taxa, like this water lily, the stamens are actually flat with an anther at the tip. And the stamens with thin filaments are just a modification from stamens with flat filaments or bases. By the way, the anther is where the microspores grow and mature as microgametophytes. And again, remember that each pollen grain is a mature haploid multicellular plant. The pistil of a flower consists of one or more carpels that enclose the ovules. The carpel is the megasporophyll, and the ovules are the megagametophytes. Sometimes there's just a single carpel enclosing a single ovule. Think about an apricot. The fruit consists of a fleshy and tasty wrapper surrounding the central seed. The megasporophyll is the part developing into the fleshy wrapper, while the megagametophyte and the embryo develop into parts of the seed. Again, the taco metaphor. An apricot is basically a seed taco, in which the megasporophyll slash carpal is playing the role of tortilla. Remember that gymnosperms are more of a tostada. Other kinds of flowers may have multiple carpels that fuse together to form the pistil, but the common theme, the synapomorphy, is that the seed is enclosed within a vessel made up of megasporophylls slash carpels. Yanchiosperms are vessel-seeded plants. So the flower consists of four distinct kinds of modified leaves, sepal, petal, microsporophyll, stamen, and megasporophyll carpal. Those of you who chose to read the Froelich et al. paper for essay number two, you'll know all about the Mads box genes and how they control the development of these four kinds of modified leaves. For our purposes here, we note another way in which the flower is a significant departure from anything seen in the non-flowering plants. None of the existing gymnosperms has Mads genes expressed in the way that flowering plants do with highly organized patterns of spatial expression that result in bisexual flowers. Flowering plants even add structures like petals for the attraction of animal pollinators, a more literal than usual take on the idea of gilding the lily. In this regard, flowering plants stand at a great distance away from the gymnosperms. Besides flowers, Angiosperms have botanically valid fruit, which means that they develop from layers of sporophytic maternal tissue enveloping the seed. Think again about the edible parts of an apricot. Other parts of the flower might be involved as well. The megasporophyll is there for sure, but you know the fleshy part of an apple that you eat? That's actually derived from sepal and petal tissue. Now what's the adaptive significance of fruits? Well, I'm glad you asked, because this is an easy one. 
Fruits are typically the vehicles by which seed dispersal occurs. Getting to some distance away from the previous sporophyte generation is a good thing. If all the plant seeds fell directly below it, its fitness would be lower compared to the different plant that was able to send its seeds to a greater area. This is the general way in which we equate dispersal distance with an important component of plant fitness. Edible fruits, like an apricot, might be carried away by a frugivorous animal, like a biology student. Other kinds of botanically valid fruits include things that people typically would not identify as fruits. Plants with dry fruits, for example, might be adapted to wind or water dispersal, or even other forms of animal dispersal. Examples of dry fruits include the little parachute thingies on dandelion seeds, or the spiny Velcro-like coatings on the burrs that stick onto my dog's fur when I take her for a walk. Another synapomorphy of flowering plants has to do with the structural unit of xylem. In lab, we will have compared the wood of gymnosperms, softwoods, with the wood of angiosperms, hardwoods. The two are relatively easily distinguished based on whether the sample has only narrow, tapered tracheids, which is a state of softwoods, or the wider, more tubular xylem vessels, which are comprised of cylindrical units called vessel elements. Vessel elements really are just derived versions of tracheids, but only angiosperms have them, and thus if you see vessel elements in a wood sample, you know it's a hardwood. Double fertilization is another characteristic that we associate with the angiosperms, though it seems to have also arisen independently in the neophytes. Double fertilization puts an interesting twist in the story that I developed earlier when I said that fertilization of the megagametophyte's egg gives rise to a diploid zygote and the rest of the megagametophyte stays haploid. Period. End of story. This is effectively a complete and true story for those seed plants having the normal single version fertilization, cycads, ginkgos, and conifers. Angiosperms do things a little differently. For the vast majority of angiosperms, the megagametophyte, or ovule, consists of seven cells with eight nuclei. In addition to the egg cell, which is cell number one, there are also two synergids, cells two and three, that sit on either side of the egg. These three cells sit together near the opening, the micropyle, of the ovule. At the opposite end of the ovule are three antipodal cells, cells four, five, and six. Now occupying the middle portion of the ovule is a central cell, cell number seven, with its two haploid nuclei, nucleus number seven and nucleus number eight. This seven cell, eight nucleus structure is the full extent of the multicellularity of the typical angiosperm megagametophyte. When pollination takes place, two sperm nuclei are released by the pollen tube. In single fertilization, there was only one sperm. In angiosperms, sperm number one fuses with the egg to form the diploid zygote. The second sperm fuses with the two nuclei of the central cell, forming a triploid nucleus. These two fertilization events, one making a diploid and one making a triploid, is the reason this is called double fertilization. Here's where things get weird. Remember that it was a haploid megagametophytic mother that takes on the role of nutritive mass of the baby plant? Well, that's single fertilization. In double fertilization in angiosperms, the triploid baby takes that role. As a seed matures, its two main parts, baby sporophyte and nutritive mass, grow as distinct but attached diploid and triploid entities, conjoined twins if you like. The triploid entity is the endosperm of the seed, and this is the carbohydrate and fat storehouse. The purely starchy parts of grains like rice and wheat are endosperm. The water inside of a coconut is liquid endosperm, while the fleshy white copper is the normal solid endosperm triploid nutrition for the baby sporophyte. Basically, the triploid twin brother to the sporophytic baby has pushed mom out of the way, and now he is going to be the baby's first meal. The last angiosperm synapomorphy I'll talk about here is something that adds to the intrigue and mystery of the disappearance of flowering plant ancestors between the Carboniferous and the Late Jurassic. 
There's a subfield of paleontology specializing on tiny plant particles, pollen, spores, microliths. These get caught in the air column and settle out as dust on the soil as well as on the ocean surface and eventually settling out onto the ocean floor. This field is called palynology, and it gives us information that can corroborate or add to what we're learning from the other methods, like traditional fossils. It turns out that the pollen of flowering plants bears another synapomorphy. Its wall is characteristically tectate columellate, meaning that there are two layers of the pollen coat with a fairly spacious air chamber in between. The outer wall, ceiling or roof, or tectum, is supported by columns, hence tectate columellate. Now the large air chamber makes the pollen grain less dense and better suited for dispersal by wind. Gymnosperms, also when pollinated, have saccate pollen. Their big air spaces hang off to the side of the microgametophyte. In other words, they're easily distinguishable from angiosperm pollen. Now the uniqueness of angiosperm pollen and palynology could therefore shed some light on that mysterious disappearance of this lineage from the time leading up to the Jurassic. Finding tectate columellate pollen from much earlier than the Jurassic would tell us that the flowering plants were there, just not fossilizing in the normal way. The basic result is that while tectate columellate pollen is clearly evident from the Jurassic onwards, there is no unequivocal pollen-based evidence of angiosperm's existence earlier than this. Again, this would seem to indicate that the immediate ancestors to flowering plants either lack the important traits that we associate with angiosperms, here the tectate columellate pollen, or possibly that they were so rare that they lived and died without leaving any traces whatsoever until the Jurassic when the lineage has surfaced in the form of angiosperms. The angiosperm clade consists of three relatively obscure basal lineages forming a grade, not a clade, and three crown clades that have many members of much greater significance to humans. The most basal plant lineage is that leading to Amborella trichopita, a single species found only on the island of New Caledonia in the South Pacific. Totally obscure and completely lacking any usefulness to humans, except for the way that it informs us about the evolutionary history of plants. This is one of the first plant species for which we sequenced the full genome, and the information we got fully confirmed that it stands alone as a sister taxon to the rest of flowering plants. It actually lacks some of the features that botanists usually treat as angiosperm synapomorphies. For example, Amborella lacks vessel elements in its xylem, which consists only of tracheids. In other words, in this respect, it's like non-angiosperms. It also shows no sign at all of a basal whole genome duplication that's evident in the rest of the angiosperms. Basically, it missed the boat of a genome duplication that occurred in the most recent common ancestor of all the other flowering plants. The next most basal lineage is the Nymphiales, or water lilies, as well as some other aquatic plants known as cabombids. Now, I'm figuring that most of you know what a water lily is, and you ought to remember that earlier you saw a picture of a water lily as an example of a basal angiosperm. The third lineage in the spatial grade is the Austrobaleales, mostly consisting of tropical vines that, like Amborella, thematically specialize in dark, disturbed habitats, reminiscent of Fields' model from the previous video. One species that should be familiar to some of us, at least, is star anise, an important flavoring ingredient having a distinctive and pleasant licorice smell. These three lineages are sometimes referred to as the A and A grade for Amborella, Nymphiales, and Austrobaleales. And generally, these are the plants most expected to bear the traits that are ancestral for the flowering plants, like the flattened stamens that I showed you earlier. The rest of the angiosperms are the mesangiospermy, and they consist of the magnoliids, the eudicots, and the monocots. Of these three, the magnoliids is the one to have split away first, and it also tends towards bearing primitive traits, not only flattened stamens, but also generally less regularity in the development of floral parts. Familiar members of the magnoliids would be magnolia trees, of course, 
but also avocados, bay laurel, cinnamonium, the cinnamon tree, and black pepper. Now the eudicot is the group with the greatest diversity of all plants, and it encompasses all the other flowering plants with the exception of monocots. Eudicots typically have triculpate pollen, that is, spherical pollen with three longitudinal grooves or lines of pores. Now if you've ever seen pictures of pollen grains that are round and spiky, that's definitely eudicot pollen. In eudicots, the floral parts occur in largely invariant fours or fives, as compared with more irregular patterns seen in magnoliids. Another easy to score trait is that the leaves have reticulate venation, but this character state is shared with magnoliids as well as the ANA grade plants. Monocots, our last group of flowering plants, are mostly very distinctive and easily recognized by virtue of their leaf appearance. Unlike most of their angiosperms, they typically have parallel rather than reticulate venation, and their floral parts come in threes rather than fours or fives. The name monocot derives from the way that the endosperm occurs as a single mass, rather than a split endosperm with two halves, which is what you see in the rest of the angiosperms. A kernel of corn, or a grain of rice, or a coconut, these all have a single unsplit mass of endosperm, and this fits perfectly with their being monocots. A peanut, which is a eudicot seed, splits into two halves, and it would not be a monocot. Okay. But water lily and star anise seeds also split into two, and neither of these are eudicots. If a seed splits into two, all you can say is that it's not a monocot. Monocots are very diverse in species number, though not nearly as diverse as the eudicots. But as far as humans and their future food security are concerned, monocots are the most important clade of flowering plants, as they comprise seven of the ten most important stable crops that feed the world's humans. Rice, wheat, maize, sorghum, yam, banana, cane, barley, oats, all of these are monocots. Eudicots are represented on this list only by potatoes, sweet potatoes, and manioc, or yucca, as top sources of calories for the human diet. From this point onward, we'll be shifting gears and directing our attention to some of the basic lessons in plant physiology, how plants are organized structurally. Our default plant for these discussions is going to be a eudicot. The other kinds of plants accomplish basically the same outcomes in similar ways, but with differences in the details. And in Bio 202, we're really after just the big picture.